Hello, welcome back to our Integrative Women's Health course. Today's topic, we're going to be focusing on polycystic ovarian syndrome. Polycystic ovarian syndrome. A typical case, for example, of one Dr. Xiao Chen Zhong, one of my uh, master that I learned from, uh, from uh, Beijing uh, University of Traditional Chinese Medicine, a 28-year-old female patient, first visit is May 11, 2009. Uh, she has been complaining that she has delayed menstruation for four years. Um, due to her moving four years ago, uh, her periods became delayed afterwards. She's averaging three to five day flow, 30 to 60 day in between cycles. And her period tends to be scanty, dark flow, with no clots. There is no particular dysmenorrhea, and her last period is March 9, 2009. And she used traditional Chinese medicine patent formulas and really didn't seem to help much. Currently, she still has delayed menstruation. She has lower back soreness and she has weakness, being tired, poor appetite. She does sleep well. Her bowel movement is pretty good. Uh, she's overweight, obese, uh, 155 centimeters her height and she weighs about 67.5 kilograms. Her tongue is pink, coating is thin, white, greasy, and the pulse is deep and slippery, deep and uh, slippery. Uh, so for example of this case, also that she menarch at age 12 and had regular menstruation cycles before her move at uh, a 30 day cycle, she's always had 30 day cycles. Upon the examination, pelvic exam, her external genitalia, uh, hair seems to be quite thick. Uh, pelvic exam is negative. Everything seems to be pretty normal. Uh, the blood test, in the blood test, her LH level is about 11.07. Uh, uh, um, 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 and uh, FSH is about 3.7A. Um, and the estrogen is about 60 um, and uh, her uh, progesterone is about 0.34, um, and uh, thyroid, uh, the testosterone is about 4.7, and prolactin is about 13.26. Um, so, and looking at transvaginal ultrasound, her uterus is about uh, 4 by 2.9 by 3.5 centimeters. Um, endometrium thickness is about 6 millimeter. Um, the left ovary, uh, appears to be a 4.1 to 2.5 centimeter, and right ovary is about 3.9 by by 2.4 centimeter. Um, so there is seems to be there is about 10 plus polycystic uh, uh, structure in this non echoed area. Uh, so she does appear having PCO uh, polycystic ovary uh, uh, situation. So what is it? Well, PCO. Uh, S, uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, is probably one of the most common endocrine disorder in women, and yet remains very difficult to explain. There's still a lot we don't know about. Uh, despite its very high prevalence in the population, controversial uh, controversy still remains today, especially regarding to its diagnosis. That's why you call the syndrome instead of disease its etiology, and the most appropriate treatment strategy for this condition. Uh, women with PCOS may have enlarged ovary that contain small collections of fluid, we call these follicles, located in each ovary uh, seen during an ultrasound exam. And we can also see hirsutism and acne. Um, people, uh, people with PCOS tends to have infrequent or prolonged menstrual cycle, or menstrual period. They can have excessive hair growth, especially in the chin, in, uh, in the chin and, and the thigh of the jaw here, uh, acne situation all around here, forehead around here, and obesity can all occur in these women with PCOS. In adolescents, we can see infrequent or absent menstruation and may raise a suspicion at that time for this particular condition. Uh, the exact cause of PCOS is still unknown. Early diagnosis and treatment alone with weight loss 
may reduce the risk of long-term complication. So weight loss and dietary change and lifestyle modification is still kind of like the first treatment principles. Um, this can also help and reduce the possibility of getting type 2 diabetes and heart disease into the future. So let's take a look at uh, epidemiology of this condition. In prevalence in the United States, PCOS is one of the most common endocrine disorder of reproductive age women with a prevalence rate of approximately 4 to 12 percent. Up to 10 percent of these women are diagnosed with PCOS during gynecological visits. Now, in some European studies, the prevalence of PCOS has been reported to be 6.5 to 8 percent, seems to be a little bit less than in the United States. There is a great deal of ethnic variability in hirsutism um, that can be observed. For example, Asians, East and Southeast Asian women, actually have less hirsutism than white women given the same serine androgen values. In a study that assessed hirsutism in Southern Chinese women, for example, investigator found a prevalence rate about 10 percent, 10.5%. And in the Hsu women, there was a significant increase in the incident of acne, menstrual irregularity, polycystic ovaries, and acanthosis uh, nigricans. So acanthosis nigricans is a skin condition characterized by an area, and usually right around the neck area, of dark, velvety discoloration uh, in body folds and creases. It affects the neck area, the armpit area, groin area. Uh, this seems to be the area that you can see. In a slide, if you're able to look at a slide, um, it's there in the slide. I am showing some picture of it. Um, the skin changes <clears throat> typically occur in people who are obese or having diabetes. Children who develop the condition um, are at higher risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Rarely, though, this condition can be a warning sign of a cancerous tumor in an internal organ such as the stomach or liver. Now, PCOS affects premenopausal women, and the age of onset is mostly frequently perimenarchial. So just around the age before a woman reaches 16 years old. However, clinical recognition of the syndrome may be delayed by the failure of the patients to become concerned by irregular menses. So a lot of times they don't necessarily go in to see the doctor right away. Um, they might not be as concerned with their hirsutism or other symptoms or by the overlaps of PCOS findings. Sometimes you can see a normal physiological maturation, especially during two years after menarche. Now, in lean women, <clears throat> they're women that's lean, with, uh, they, but you can still get uh, PCOS with a genetic predisposition. Uh, the syndrome may be unmasked when they subsequently gain weight. So sometimes when they gain weight, that's when the symptoms start to uh, come up. So the age affected, it can be going from adolescence all the way to a, menar, uh, a menopause situation. So let's take a look at prognosis of PCOS. Uh, PCOS does have a lot of different things, a lot of different clinical features that surrounds this syndrome. The first is cardiovascular disease risk. There are absolutely evidence that suggests that a woman with PCOS may be at an increased risk for cardiovascular and cerebral vascular diseases. Uh, women with hyperandrogenism have elevated serine lipoprotein level cholesterol, for example, similar to those of men. They are also associated risk with insulin resistance or type 2 diabetes. Approximately 40% with PCOS have insulin resistance that is independent of body weight. These women 
are at increased risk of type 2 diabetes and consequently cardiovascular complications. So the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists and the American College of Endocrinology does and do recommend screening for diabetes by age 30 years old in all patients of PCOS, including doesn't matter if it's obese or non-obese woman. Now, in patients who particularly had a particularly elevated risk, testing before 30 years old may be indicated. Patient who initiated initially test negative for diabetes should still periodically reassess throughout her lifetime. That is still important. These patients can also, PCOS can also have associated risk of having endometrial hyperplasia. Um, there's an increased risk of this condition and carcinoma. Because the chronic end ovulation in PCOS, what happened in that, it, it leads to constant endometrial stimulation with estrogen without progesterone protection. And this increases the risk of endometrial hyperplasia and carcinoma. The Royal College of Obstetrician and as well as Gynecologist, um, ARCOG, recommends uh, induction of restore bleeding with progesterone, a minimal of every three to four uh, cycles, every three to four months. This is very important for us as clinicians to educate our patients, discuss with our patients the symptoms of PCOS, as well as the increased risk for all these associated situations such as cardiovascular and cerebral vascular diseases warranted. We need to educate our patients with this condition in women with this condition regarding to lifestyle modification, such as weight reduction, such as increased exercise and dietary modifications. Now, breast and ovarian cancer with PCOS, there is really no known association with breast or ovarian cancer has been found. Those, there is no additional surveillance is needed for these uh, two types of cancer. So let's move, on, move forward to practice key points. Look at some of the practice key points. First of all, uh, women with PCOS have abnormalities in metabolism of androgen and estrogen in a control of androgen production. Therefore, PCOS can result from abnormal function of the HPO hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis. And when a woman is diagnosed with PCOS, uh, I'm sorry, when a woman is diagnosed with polycystic ovaries, um, is usually how we diagnose is, uh, if she has 12 or more follicles uh, in at least one of the ovary. That would be PCO. Now, let's take a look at the endocrine society guidelines for diagnosis and management of PCOS. In October 2013, the endocrine society released practice guidelines for the diagnosis and treatment of PCOS. And the following are among their conclusions. Basically, using the Rotterdam uh, uh, criteria for diagnosing PCOS, which is a presence of two of the following. Either you have androgen access, ovarian dysfunction, or PCO. Uh, either two of them will give you the diagnosis uh, of PCOS. So if we look at uh, Rotterdam, a uh, consensus of 2003, um, in 2003, the Rotterdam European Society for Human Reproduction, as well as the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, sponsor a PCOS consensus workshop group, which proposed that the diagnosis, again, including two out of three of the following criteria. One, oligal and or ovulation, and ovulation. Two, clinical and or biochemical hyperandrogenism. Number three, and polycystic ovaries on ultrasound. And as long as other etiology must and have been excluded. So there are some differences 
Uh, but overall, uh, there's some differences between different society and National Institute of Health. But basically, they all adhere to this guideline. Now, let's go back to the intercon society guideline for a moment. <clears throat> In adolescence, with PCOS, hyperandrogenism is central to the presentation. So in that situation, in the conventional sense, hormone contraception and metformin are the treatment option in this population, when, especially when they're not trying to um, get pregnant at this time. Now, postmenopausal women do not have consistent PCOS uh, phenotype, so a lot of time you don't necessarily treat uh, the reproductive cycle and menstrual cycle situation. Now, we do need to exclude alternate androgen excess disorders and risk factors for cardiovascular disease, diabetes, endometrial cancer, mood disorder, and abstract, abstract, uh, obstructive uh, sleep apnea. Continue onward from the endocrine society guidelines. For infertility, clomiphene is the first nine treatment. For metabolic glycemic abnormalities, and for improving menstrual irregularity, metformin can be an option and can be beneficial. Metformin is, of course, of a limited or no benefit at all in managing hirsutism, acne, or infertility. Obviously, more investigation is needed to determine the roles of weight loss and statins, for example, in PCOS. Um, so there's a drug called glitazones. Uh, this is a class of medication that's used in treatment of diabetes, type 2. They were introduced in the late 1990s. And that can also be used, but is really, there is a pretty much of an unfavorable risk benefit ratio. That's why it's uh, been discontinued by a lot of endocrinologists. Now, in the signs of symptom, the major features of PCOS. Um, include menstrual dysfunction uh, and ovulation and signs of hyperandrogenism. Other signs and symptoms of PCOS may include the following, hirsutism, infertility, obesity and metabolic syndrome, diabetes, and not least, obstructive sleep apnea. So let's take a look at medical history, history of PCOS. We want to take a good thorough history, for example, in family history, we want to take a look at the menstrual history, the adrenal enzyme deficiency, if there's any, history of hirsutism in family, history of infertility and obesity and metabolic syndromes in the family. Now, patients with PCOS have abnormal menstruation pattern attributed to chronic anovulation, and the patient usually by herself has a history of menstrual disturbance and might be dating back to menarche. Some women have oligomenorrhea. Uh, basically, um, maybe um, um, this is a situation where the menstrual bleeding occurs in an interval of 35 days to about six months with less than nine menstrual periods per year. Or a secondary amenorrhea, where that is an absence of menstruation for six months. Now, dysfunctional uterine bleeding and infertility are the other consequences of anovulatory menstrual cycles. So the menstrual irregularity in PCOS usually presents around the time of menarche. The, hyper, hyper, the, the hyperandrogenism clinically manifests as an excessive terminal body hair in a male distribution pattern. Hair is commonly sensed in the upper lip, in the chin, around the nipple, along the nine, the linea alba of the lower abdomen. And some patients have um, acne and even to the point of male pattern hair loss, or we call it androgenic alopecia. Other signs can include clitomacaly, uh, can include increased muscle mass, voice deepening, uh, uh, more of a characteristics of an extreme situation of PCOS um, and things such as also hyperthecosis. Um, these are signs and symptoms. Could also be consistent 
with an androgen-producing tumor, so we need to exclude that diagnosis, as well as exogenous androgen administration uh, or um, other possible congenital of adrenal hypoplasia. Hyperthecosis is a um, hypoplasia of the theca interna of the ovary. It is when an area of luteinization occurs along with stroma hypoplasia. The luteinized cell produces androgens, which may lead to hirsutism and uh, musculinization. Um, and premature andronarch is a common occurrence, and in some cases may present a precursor to PCOS. So a woman sometimes, a girl sometimes, could already start having excessive hair, could already start having obesity, even before they present having menstruation. So the American College uh, of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, ACOG, recommends screening with as well the 17 hydroxyprogesterone levels in women suspected of having PCOS who are at increased risk for non-classical congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Now, a subset of women with PCOS is infertile. Not every PCOS patient is infertile, but there is a subset where that is a, a large woman is infertile, especially when these women does not ovulate properly um, or ovulate intermittently. Now, contraception, conception may take longer than in other women. Women with PCOS may also have fewer children than they had planned. In addition, the rate of miscarriage is also higher in affected women. Now, in obesity and metabolic syndrome, nearly half of all women with PCOS are clinically obese. A study comparing the body mass index in American and Italian women with PCOS showed that American women had a BMI higher than that of their Italian counterparts. Women with PCOS should be assessed for their cardiovascular risk by evaluating their BMI, fasting the pit, and lipoprotein levels, and risk factors for metabolic syndrome. Now, many patients with PCOS have characteristics of metabolic syndrome. In fact, one study shown a 43% of prevalence of metabolic syndrome in women with PCOS. So just to give you some idea that not every PCOS patient is going to have metabolic syndrome, but it is quite high of a prevalence. Now, <clears throat> in women, <clears throat> metabolic syndrome is characterized by abdominal obesity where the waist circumference is greater than 35 inch. Um, there might be dyslipidemia where the triglyceride level is greater than 150 milligram uh, per deciliter, a deciliter. Uh, high density lipoprotein cholesterol level can be um, less than 50 milligram. Elevated blood pressure, you can see also that. And you can have a poor inflammatory state characterized by an elevated C-reactive protein level and a poor thrombotic uh, state characterized by elevated prosminogen activator inhibitor 1 and, and fibrinogen uh, levels. Um, and women with PCOS have an increased prevalence of coronary artery calcification and thickened carotid Entema media, which may be responsible for subclinical atherosclerosis. Now, prospective long-term cardiovascular outcome study in PCOS are needed to assess whether the increased cardio risk in PCOS results in a higher cardiovascular event rates. ACOG does recommend screening for type 2 diabetes and in, in, in impaired glucose tolerance in women with PCOS by obtaining a fasting glucose level, then a 2-hour glucose level after a 75-gram glucose low or glucose challenge. Approximately 10% of women with PCOS have type 2 diabetes, and 30 to 40% of women with PCOS have impaired 
glucose tolerance by 40 years old. Um, and sleep apnea can also be an issue. Many women with PCOS have obstructive sleep apnea syndrome, which is an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Ask these patients and or their partners about sex excessive daytime uh, somnolence. An individual with this uh, obstructive sleep apnea tends to experience a lot of snoring or sometimes apnea episodes during their sleep where they literally stop breathing. Now, for women with PCOS with suspected um, sleep apnea syndrome, there should be a low threshold for referral for sleep assessment. Patient may also be screened um, in a clinical setting, such as using tools, such as the what we call the Epworth sleepiness uh, score. Now, the Epworth sleepiness score or scale is widely used in the field of sleep medicine as a subjective measure of patient's sleepiness. The test is a list of a situation in which you rate your tendency to become sleepy on a scale of zero, which is no chance of dozing, to three, which is a high chance of dozing. When you finish the test, you add up the value of your response and your total score is based on the scale of 0 to 24. And the scale estimates whether you are experiencing excessive sleepiness that possibly require medical attention. Um, so um, they break down into situations such as when you're watching TV, uh, when you're sitting, uh, those kind of situations that you would create a score. Now, the next thing we should look at is physical exam of PCOS. Obviously, <clears throat> patient can exhibit many signs. For example, of hirsutism uh, or uh, musculinization signs, you could have excessive body hair in the male distribution pattern as well as acne. And some patients have musculinization signs such as male pattern bonus or, or alopecia. Uh, you could have increased muscle mass, deepening voice, or clitomacaly. Um, and uh, findings should prompt a search for other causes. Uh, make sure that you exclude other hyperandrogenisms. Um, there is also the modified uh, Ferriman Galway score, grades 11 body areas, from zero means no hair, to four, frankly musculinized. Uh, includes the upper lip, the chin, the chest, upper and lower abdomen, thighs, upper and lower back, arms, forearms, buttock. A total score of eight or more is considered abnormal for an adult white woman. A score of 44 is the most severe. Okay, so in the slide, I show you an image of the modified Fairman Galway score system for you to look at. Now, approximately 50% of women with PCOS have abnormal abdominal obesity, characterized by the waist circumference. So sometimes we call this centripetal weight gain. Um, the waist circumference greater than 35 inches is considered to have abdominal obesity. And don't forget, acanthosis nigricans is a, again, diffuse, velvety, thickening situation of the skin fall in the neck area, in the armpit area, as well as in the groin area. Um, so this thought to be a result of insulin resistance, although uh, syndromic and familiar variants are described, this situation can also be a cutaneous marker for possible malignancy, so we need to be careful when we see this. Um, so uh, there are actually different grades of this. There is the zero grade, which is absence, to as high as severe phi is uh, what we call a circumferential uh, grading. Moving forward to blood pressure, uh, patients with signs and symptoms of metabolic syndrome may have elevated blood pressure with a systolic blood pressure of 130 or higher or a diastolic blood pressure of about 85 uh, or higher. Um, so you do want to take a look at the blood pressure situation. And obviously, you might and most likely 
you will see in large ovary, not everybody. Um, but the evaluation for in large ovaries are usually through ultrasound, through ultrasound. So we want to be able to do some differential diagnosis because uh, they are a condition that does mimic PCOS, and we should really rule them out before a diagnosis of PCOS is confirmed. So we need to take a look at some of these conditions. For example, you need to rule out uh, primary ovarian hyperthecosis, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, drugs. The use of denosyl, use of androgenic progestins can also uh, create a mimicry of this condition. Hypothyroidism, a uh, patient with menstrual disturbance and signs of hyperandrogenism, idiopathic hirsutism, familiar hirsutism, muscularization, tumor of the adrenal glands or ovaries, cushion syndrome, hyperprolactinemia, exogenous and, and, uh, anabolic steroid use, uh, stroma, hyper, stroma hyperthecosis, okay? So these are things you want to try to rule out. Now, although obesity itself is not considered part of the differential diagnosis, obesity, as we said before, is highly associated with insulin resistance or any condition that is associated with severe insulin resistance, which may clinically manifest in the same way as PCOS. Obesity, therefore, may unmask feature of PCOS in women who are genetically predisposed to this syndrome. And there are other things you need to rule out. For example, of acromegaly, amenorrhea, gigantism, um, hyperprolactinemia, hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism, eotrogenic cushion syndrome, ovarian tumor. So these are some of the things that you do want to rule out. And if we look at PCOS treatment in Western medicine, basically, um, you know, really the very first thing with patients to make some change, the number one approach should be lifestyle modification, diet, exercise, weight control, contraception, skin care, emotional care should be probably <clears throat> your first line of treatment. And if that doesn't work out, you can try metformin, 1,500 to 2,000 uh, milligram a day. Or you can do oral contraceptive, or you can do uh, flutamide, um, spirulactin. Or uh, if you are trying to get pregnant, you want to use uh, clomiphene, citrate, or uh, letrozole, or gonadotropins, or even ovarian drilling and the worst situation, IVF situation. So let's go to traditional Chinese medicine. <clears throat> the TCM perspective is that this is a zanghu dysfunction, and it's also there are direct causes to this condition. And in the zanghu dysfunction, basically is the kidney deficiency, spleen deficiency, as well as liver stasis. And, uh, and the direct causes are basically phlegm dam, as well as stagnant blood. These are the direct causes. And in etiology, there is non-endogenous and there's non-exogenous, and there's also endogenous. Endogenous cause is basically coming from the inside, usually have to do with the effect of the organs. So a lot of times the dysfunction of spleen, liver, and kidney. Uh, now, in the invasion of phlegm dam invasion, this can come from the inside, this come from the outside. So it can be from both ways. Uh, so phlegm dam invasion is one big one. Uh, in pathology, in endogenous, you know, a lot of time this is due to kidney yang deficiency, unable to warm up and transform water dampness, or spleen yang deficiency, where it is unable to transport <clears throat> and transform water dampness. <clears throat> and this water dampness retention <clears throat> can create phlegm, and that the phlegm can create a turbidity to block the bao gong. So that's a pathology, endogenous pathology. You might also see it in, for example, kidney in deficiency with fire rising or liver stasis causing fire. These two situations can all cause parching of the body fluid. And when you keep on boiling, keep on overheating the body fluid, guess what happened? 
that water is going to become stickier. It's going to become a phlegm. So you transfer to the phlegm and that in turn cause phlegm turbidity blocking the bowel gong. Uh, then there's the non-exogenous and non-endogenous type of pathology. You could have a cold invasion, cause the kidney yang, confined, unable to warm. You could have a dam invasion, cause the spleen yang, confined, unable to transport. Both of these cause water dam retention to create phlegm. Again, at the end of the day, it's always the phlegm turbidity blocking the bao gong is the pathology. So in TCM, it's management and treatment are in the categories of treating amenorrhea, infertility, abnormal uterine bleeding, and zhenjia conditions. There are four main syndromes. We have kidney yang deficiency with stagnancy. We have kidney yin deficiency with stagnancy. We have qi deficiency with phlegm. We have liver qi uh, stasis. Let's look at the kidney yang deficiency with stagnancy. This is when we see irregular delayed menstruation. We see infertility history, obesity, hirsutism. There is oligo or hypomenorrhea, amenorrhea, underdevelopment of breasts, aversion to cold, colon, sore back, decreased libido, decreased vaginal discharge or lubrication. Tongue appears pale, coating is thin white, and the pulse is deep threading. In kidney indeficiency <clears throat> with stagnancy, we can see irregular delayed menstruation. We can see delayed menarche, infertility history, and hirsutism. So we can see oligo and or hypomenorrhea, bright red flow, irregular vaginal bleeding, amenorrhea, underdevelopment of breast, sore back, decreased libido, decreased vaginal discharge or lubrication, dry mouth. Tongue is usually red. Coating is usually lacking or decreasing and the pulse is usually threading and rapid. Now, if we look at qi deficiency with phlegm, we will see obese patient, hirsute patient, oligo and or hypomenorrhea, but the flow is going to be pinker flow, irregular vaginal breathing, spotting, amenorrhea, nausea, reflux. You're going to have epigastric distension, lethargic sleep, fatigue, sore back, there should be decreased libido, excessive vaginal white discharge, diarrhea, and poor appetite. So the tongue here can appear to be pale, swollen with teeth mark, coating is white and greasy, and pulse is thin, slippery, or deep thin. And the fourth syndrome is liver cheese stasis. This is where a lot of time we see in history of severe emotional trauma. Uh, this patient can have hirsutism oligo and or hypomenorrhea, amenorrhea, deep red flow with clots. She might have acne, breast tenderness, irritability, restlessness, constipated, bitter and or dry mouth. Tongue is frequently dark red. Coating is usually thin yellow. And pulse is wiry, slippery, and rapid. So in these four situations, we have very strong herbal strategy for this. Um, in a kidney yang deficiency with stagnancy, we use modified gui sen wan, modified gui sen wan, as well as gui sen zi zao tang, gui sen zi zao tang. In a kidney yin deficiency with stagnancy, we use liu wei di wang wan combined with si xiao san, or we can use Professor Lu Yuan Kan's experiential formula for this. Then the third, where you have qi deficiency with phlegm, we can use modified Chang Zhu Dao Tang Tang uh, or Dao Tang Wan. Or second, we can use uh, uh, Si Jing Yi's uh, experiential formula, which we'll talk in a moment. Uh, in the liver qi stasis situation, uh, we can use uh, Dan Ji Xiao Yao Wan uh, at uh, uh, Qin Qi Hua Tang Wan combination. Um, so that's the herbal strategy for this condition. Uh, in a kidney yang deficiency, if we only have kidney yang deficiency, then we can always use yo gui one and jing gui di shen qi one. But if we have kidney yang deficiency with a lot of phlegm damp, this is where gui shen zi zao tang is helpful. And basically it's a gui shen one plus ban xia chang zu dang nan xing can also be used. So let's take a look at um, gui shen one uh, plus minus. 
Now, in this situation, what we want to do is use a combination of two shizi, ah, du zhong, gou ji zi, san zu yi, dang gui, shou di, san yao, fu ding. And this is where we can add ban xia, cang zu, and dan nan xin to the mix. We can add huang qi, dang sen bai zu, if it's fatigue, poor appetite with diarrhea. If we can add uh, uh, san za, chuan xiong, if this menorrhea with dark red clots. We can also use Gui Shen Ci Zao Tang, which is a combination of two Si Zi Du Zhong, Zi Si Yin, Xian Ling Pi Ba Ji Tian, San Yao Shou Di Dang Gui, San Ci Gu, Zao Jiao Ci, Xia Gu Cao, and Xiang Bei Mu. Okay. Um, in kidney yin deficiency with stagnancy, we can use a combination of Liu Wei Di Huang Wan plus Si Xiao San. Liu Wei Di Huang Wan obviously is Shou Di San Zhu Yi, San Yao, Zhe Xie Fu Ning, and Dan Pi. And you can add in basically Pu Huang and Wu Ning Zi. You can also add Zi Mu, Huang Bai for deficient fire. You can also add Da Huang, Mang Xiao, Zi Si for constipation. You can also add Bo Zi Ren for insomnia. Now, kidney yin deficiency with stagnancy, we can also select Dr. Luo Yan Kai's experiential formula. Professor Luo Yan Kai is a very famous uh, TCM OBGYN in the southern part of China in Guangzhou uh, city. Um, the formula he has devised is Shen Di 15 gram, Gou Ji 15 gram, Lu Zhen 15 gram, San Yao 20 gram, Zhen uh, uh, Zumu 20 gram. San Zhu Yi, 12 gram, Xian Ling Pi, 9 gram, Ji Xue Ten, about 20 gram, and He Shou Wu, about 20 gram. In this situation, we can also add Yu Jin, Bai Sao, He Huang Pi, 15 gram each for liver stasis, if there is any. We can also add Yi Mu Cao, 20 gram, Dan Shen, 20 gram, Tao Lin, 12 gram, Hong Hua, 12 gram, for any kind of blood stagnation. Let's move on to qi deficiency with phlegm. This is where we can use modified cang zu dao tang wan. Cang zu dao tang wan is a combination of fu lin ban xia chen pi, gan cao, cang zu, xiang hu, xian hu, xiang hu, dan nan xin, zi ke, shen jiang, and shen qu. And in that situation, we can add huang qi and dan shen into the mix for qi deficiency. We can add dang gui, Chuan Xiong, Ji Xue Ten for high pole menorrhea. We can also add Pu Huang, Wu Lin Zi, Yi Mu Cao for blood stagnation, especially if you have a lot of pain. Another formula to treat Qi deficiency with phlegm is uh, Dr. Professor <coughs> Si Jin Yi's experiential formula. This is a combination of Chuan San Jia, which we don't use anymore, Cao Jiao Ci, Kun Bu, Dan Shen, E Zhu, Bai Jie Zi and Ti Ni Zi. Uh, this is a, a formula that's used for this kind of condition. And continue on, if you have liver cheese stasis, we can use a combination of um, Dan Ji, Xiao Yao San, and Qin Qi Hua Tang. So we have Dan Ji Zi, Dan Pi, I'm sorry, Dan Pi, uh, San Ji Zi, Dan Gui Bai Sao, Cai Hu Bai Zhu, Fu Ling Shen Jiang, Bo He Zi Gan Cao. And we can add the Qin Qi Hua Tang of Gua Lou Ren, Wang Qin, Fu Ling, Zi Si, Xin Ren, Chen Pi, Dan Nan Xin, and Ban Xia into the mix. Now, acupuncture therapy can be very helpful. Um, Professor Zhu uses, um, from day 1 to 14, uses electroacupuncture, conception vessel, point number 3 to 4. And that's one pair. And you can do zi gong to stomach 36. That's bilateral pair. Three day consecutive and one more treatment after one week. Um, and the Professor Lin uses an alternating of three groups combining with herbal therapies. The first group use spleen 6, CV4, spleen A, and stomach 28. The second group uses stomach 29, kidney 12, CV2, and spleen 10. The third group uses stomach 28, CV3, stomach 29, and spleen 6. Professor Si, Si Chang, 
she also suggests deep needling of a zigong point of the enlarged ovary, uh, deep needling of C4, CV4 to the uterus. If you're not very skilled, you may not want to do this because you create and possibly might have some damage to the inter- internal organ when you do so. Um, and then there are miscellaneous herbal therapy that's useful. For example, uh, Dr. Yu Jin has an experiential formula. Uh, it's a combination of so di san zu yu, bu gu zi, xian ning pi, huang jin, tao lin, uh, zao jiao ci, and sang zi gu. This formula tonifies kidney, dissolve phlegm, activate blood, and regulate menstruation. So coming back to our original case of Dr. Xiao Chen Zhong, a 28-year-old female, first visits May 11, 2009, delayed menstruation for four years due to moving. Periods became delayed afterwards. Period flow, three to five days. Period of cycle, three to 60 days. A scanty, dark flow with no clots. There is no painful periods. The last menstrual cycle is March 9, 2009, and has used TCM pattern. There's no help. And currently, um, there's delayed menstruation, lower back soreness, weakness. There's poor appetite. Sleep well, bowel movement's good. Obese. There's, she's about 155 centimeter, weights about 67.5 kilogram. Tongue is pink. Coating is white, greasy and the pulse is deep slippery. And again, <clears throat> she may not about age 12, had a regular menstrual cycle before uh, the move at the uh, 30-day cycle, that's what she had. The exam and the examination, the external genitalia here seems to be quite thick, but pelvic exam is negative. Again, blood test, LH is at 11, FSH is at three, E2 is at 60, uh, uh, progesterone is at 0.34, testosterone is at 4.7, prolactin is at 13.26, transvaginal ultrasound seals, uterus at 4 by 2.9, 3 by 5, endo is at 6 millimeter, left ovaries, uh, size of left ovaries 4.1 by 2.5, right ovaries about 3.9 by 2.4, and there's 10 plus polycystic uh, cysts. Uh, that's uh, shown in a non-echoed area. So the TCM diagnosis in this situation is delayed menstruation infertility. Western medicine diagnosis is PCOS, primary infertility. And uh, diff, uh, the TCM uh, uh, um, syndrome diagnosis is kidney spleen deficiency and flame stagnation. So the treatment principle is to tonify kidney, strengthen the spleen. Okay, this is your organ strengthening then you want to disperse phlegm and relieve stagnancy. So the formula she has selected is Xu Duan 15 gram, Du Zhong 15 gram, San Ji Sen 15 gram, Ba Ji Tian 15 grams, Tu Si Zi 15 gram, Bai Zhu 15 gram, Fu Ling 15 gram, Chen Pi 12 gram, Da Nan Xin 6 gram, Gan Chao 6 gram, Ban Xia 10 gram, Zi Si is about 15 gram, Yin Chen is about 15 gram, Zerlan is 15 gram, <clears throat> Chuan Niu Xi is 15 gram, and now that is, Xiang Hu is 12 gram. It's a pretty big formula. Now, she, uh, this patient had four visits within two months with some mild modification. And uh, on August 23, 2009 visit, her health age is 5.23, FSH is a 4, E2 is 100, uh, progesterone is 0.33, Testosterone level has gone down to 2.5, prolactin level is 12.57, and she at the same time lost 6.5 kilograms. That's quite a bit. Now, patient continued herbs for another six months, and her menstruation finally normalized, and she actually conceived. So in this chart, I'll show you the LH. Uh, if you look at the LH, you know, LH is supposed to rise around ovulation. For uh, other times, LH level is extremely low and usually is below 10. But for some patients, especially PCO patients, whatever reason, their LH seems to be a little bit elevated. And uh, prolactin level uh, usually um, can be uh, elevated during the time of when you are pregnant and also when you're breastfeeding. 
Um, in the PCOS situation, prolactin level can play a little havoc, can be a little bit elevated, and that sometimes, or can be normal, you know, latin can be normal. Um, LH usually, as I say again, uh, can be a little elevated uh, with uh, people who have PCOS. And estrogen level. A lot of times, a lot of this follicular cyst uh, produces extra estrogen, so the estrogen level sometimes can be elevated. Uh, if you look at chart over here, you'll see the estrogen level gradually climb up to the time when you ovulate. So a lot of times, a lot of PCOA patients, even at the very beginning of their cycle, their estrogen is already rising much earlier than other people. And testosterone level are also very interesting. You'll see in the PCOS patients, the testosterone level is a little bit higher than their cohort, than their peers. And there are other tests that you may want to consider, especially if you're treating a patient for a metabolic condition. So for example, you may want to do fasting glucose, triglyceride, um, LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, uh, besides your standard FSH, LH, and testosterone test. You can also do DHEA. You can do 17-hydroxy uh, um, uh, progesterone. Um, you can also do insulin uh, and also um, um, insulin resistance testing. So this concludes uh, this topic on PCOS. I hope this is helpful to you, and I look forward to see you next time. Thank you so much for your participation and your listening.